Welcome to the Post Questionnaire. 35 questions giving us insight into what makes creative people tick. Hi, Uli, what's new today? Oh, I'm great. I'm really excited today because the guest is one of your close friends and someone I have not met in person. You two will love each other, I think. Her name is Susan Fales Hill. Uh, she is an accomplished writer. She's written novels. She's written a memoir about her amazing mother, Josephine Premise, called Always Wear Joy. But currently, she is best known as the showrunner for Lena Waite's new sitcom on the BET called Twenties. And as far as I know, it's the first American sitcom to focus on uh, the life of a um, young a queer woman of color and her friends in their 20s. Uh, Susan, uh, long ago, had this kind of great start in her career as a TV writer, um, working for the first for The Cosby Show. She was a writer for The Cosby Show right out of college, and then for uh, A Different World, the sitcom that was like the follow-on to The Cosby Show. And both of those were really notwithstanding the tainted legacy now of Bill Cosby, they were really groundbreaking um, television shows for for America in terms of portraying people of color in non-stereotyped characters and situations. And so it's really thrilling at this particular moment in our culture in America to get her perspective on what's going on, on her, on her work. And, um, and she's just smart and funny. And I, I, I think we'll have a fun time talking with her. I'm so excited. And I always think about this, Carrie, because we both love literature. And I think the power of representation, of cultural representation, sometimes I think rivals that of politics and laws, that you can pass laws and you can pass congressional acts. But to change people's minds, it needs the media and books and films and TV. So her work and TV has been that kind of to open doors, to break open new possibilities for people. Um, yeah. Just want to mention uh, Susan Fails Hill, all one word is on Twitter, of course, so people should follow her. And we have an Instagram account, if you can mention that. I'm on Instagram as Uli NYC, U-L-I-N-Y-C, or Uli Bear Twitter. You can find out more about what I'm doing as People who listen to the show before know I teach at New York University. I teach photography and literature. My great love is really poetry and literature. And I also edit classic books, everything from Frankenstein to James Walton Johnson. Um, and uh, maybe mention also two things. I We actually met on my other podcast after having been friends for 30 years. We met again in this new mode and format when I had a conversation and learned from you about Marcel Proust's and novel and the women who were the models for that great book. Yeah, no. So my latest book is called uh, Proust's Duchess. And it was really fun to come on your other podcast, think about it and talk to you about one of the great literary works of all time, Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. And that's what gave us the idea to get together again and to do this podcast together, taking the 35 questions from this famous questionnaire that has become associated with Proust's name, even though it has nothing to do with the novel. Like you, I'm a literature lover and professor. Uh, you and I uh, first met at Harvard as undergrads, went to Yale grad school together, and now I'm also teaching in New York, but I teach French literature at Barnard College and Columbia University uptown. And uh, yeah, literature is my great love. And it's one of the reasons I'm so excited that we have uh, made the decision to focus this podcast on creative people. Uh, for me, I'm always uh, both daunted and thrilled to get to learn more about the kind of the great minds of the people that we talk to, whether they're photographers or painters or writers or humanitarians. So it's great fun. And yeah, our um, podcast uh, Instagram handle is Proust dot questionnaire. And my Instagram handle is Caroline Weber 2020, all one word, and the twos and the zeros are numbers and not words. So yeah, let's talk to Susan Fales Hill. I think this will be a fun one. Great, let's go. Today is a great day on the Proust Questionnaire podcast because we're talking to one of my favorite writers and individuals, Susan Fales Hill. Thank you for joining us from New York on Zoom today. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to stay in my study and be with fascinating people. 
<laughs> we feel so lucky that you made the time to uh, to talk to us today. It's such a busy time between cooking, cleaning, <laughs> donning a mask to walk the dog. I don't it's, know how I squeezed you in, but I managed. <laughs> you are, yeah, you're a good, good egg and a good friend, and we're really happy to have you here. So let's start with the first of these 35 questions. Yes. What is your idea of perfect happiness? My idea of perfect happiness is being among people I love, like-minded minds and uh, souls, um, being in a beautiful environment having a fantastic book to read and then being able to discuss it with said loved ones or a delicious meal with, as you know, a delicious beefy red wine. <laughs> a beefy red is <laughs> the cherry on the cake. Uh, gosh, that's all sounding really good right now. Yes. Uh, Susan, what is your greatest fear? My greatest fear would be losing my child, my beautiful daughter, Josephine Bristol. Yeah. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? I most deplore my tendency towards procrastination. And one of my favorite quotes is from, I believe it's E.L. Doctorow. He said, researching is not writing. Outlining is not writing. Only writing is writing. And unfortunately, <laughs> my <laughs> oh. method of procrastination goes far beyond researching and outlining, which arguably are at least on the path. <laughs> in my process, I'm so out in the wilderness. I'm not even in the same zip code as writing. So, oh, that cuts to the bone. I, I know that you love research. I don't know about your attitude toward outlining. Are you an outliner when you sit down? I'm, I'm terrible at that. I do believe in outlining, if only because you don't build a house without having a blueprint. Yeah, I do find that especially if you're writing a novel or if you're writing a script or even a work of nonfiction, mm -hmm. you may find you want to depart from your outline. And I found this, especially in my, the two novels that I wrote, my character would suddenly say, that's not what I want to do, but at least mm -hmm. I had a point of departure. Mm -hmm. And I do the same thing actually when I'm speaking publicly, I write the whole thing down, but then in the moment, spontaneous things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find when you have that structure, it's like having an education, frankly, mm -hmm. um, yeah. or, or knowing the basic notes or knowing the proper steps of ballet and then being able to play around. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, there's a story that one often hears about Picasso, that he was the greatest line draftsman yes. uh, of his you lifetime. Would never, you would never know from looking at, I mean, you do if you've looked at the sort of the whole retrospective of his, but exactly. Yeah. But it's you have that underpinning and then you can choose to discard it or play with it. Well, in that sense, that doesn't sound like something terribly to deplore in yourself. But um, well, but no, but I you see my procrastination, as I said, there are many steps before getting to the outlining. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, those steps. Uh, what I add? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looking at a vacation website is not <laughs> right. <laughs> Playing with the dog a little bit because he'd like the attention. Writing enraged uh, posts on Facebook is not writing. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. What is the trait you most deplore in others? I would, I really thought about this and I would have to say willful ignorance because I feel it lies at the root of so many of the evils that we see. Racism is built, uh, is based on willful ignorance a lot of the problems of our nation right now are based on willful ignorance because we refuse to really look honestly at the history and really understand what brought us to this point and why certain groups have been completely marginalized. Uh, if you have um, a, a loved one who's suffering and you refuse to listen to them, you know, to me, it's, it's really at the root of callousness and the root of uh, inhumanity. So I would have to say willful ignorance. Oh. Uh, Susan, which living person do you most admire? So uh, there are a few living people whom I most admire. Uh, one of them is on the 
front lines of the COVID battle. She's my mm -hmm. former Lise Francais de New York classmate, Sylvie de Souza. She runs the emergency room at that Brooklyn and hosp uh, hospital in Brooklyn that was so heavily affected mm -hmm. uh, and had one of the wow. largest number of cases. And she's going to work every day and fighting the good fight. And this is a woman who could have chosen to do many other things with her life. Um, and then I'd have to say uh, Sherilyn Eiffel, who's the head of the Legal Defense Fund, uh, which was founded by Thurgood Marshall and many other incredible um, warriors for justice. And she is in the trenches every day fighting for equality uh, and inclusion and uh, a level playing field um, and keeping her spirits up in, in a very dark time. So. Yeah. What's yeah. the name of the first person you named? The, uh, the Sylvie de Souza. Okay. Sylvie de Souza. Sylvie de Souza. Yeah. Sylvie de Souza. Yeah. <laughs> Souza. That's I mean, and so you've been in touch with her during during the the yes. pandemic. Yes. So we hadn't been in touch much over the years since graduating, and then. I read an article in the New York Times and there she was. And it turns out we have lots of friends in common. And so we've been texting uh, through this pandemic. Yeah. She's a remarkable woman. Uh, what is your greatest extravagance? So my greatest extravagance used to be um, very expensive clothes and handbags. Uh, I am the Amel DeMarcos of handbags. I'm just going to put that out there right now. <laughs> and I don't spend as much money as I used to on these things, but I, I feel like I've, I stockpiled the way other people were stockpiling um, hand sanitizer. I stockpiled beautiful clothes and, and purses during my youth. And so now I'm sitting on the pile. <laughs> and not as useful during the lockdown, are they, the handbags? Or do you go from room no, to room? No, I'm just walking around my house looking like Miss Haversham, Nico, <laughs> Miss Antoinette at the Amu. Just <laughs> why not? And yeah, the handbags, unfortunately, aren't a lot of use. But the clothes, I can still put on. In fact, I put on a blouse the other day, and my daughter said, I had no idea we were doing the community theater version of Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh. <laughs> You know that your daughter Bristol is my the is the is my fashion icon, but also I'm afraid of her. Because <laughs> you once pointed out to me when she was like 11, and we were commenting together and kind of cackling together about some rather ridiculous outfit that we had seen, and and you said, "Well, yes, you know, Bristol prefers a cleaner line." And I thought, oh my God, when I was 11, I didn't know what a clean line was, or I would have thought it was, you know, something you make with your tracing paper and a ruler. And the sophistication that your child has in matters sartorial is very intimidating to somebody who's five times her age. Yes. <laughs> did you change out of the blouse or did you keep it on to defy? I just kept it on to look ridiculous and continue. And she did ask me to put a necklace on. If, if I was going to wear this, at least put a necklace on it. <laughs> <laughs> What is your current state of mind, Susan? My current state of mind is very reflective because being 57 years old, having lived through the 1992 uprisings in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, having been whatever, six years old during the 1968, 69 eruptions, and just seeing these periodic paroxysms uh, in America it really gives me pause and makes me say, what is it that I need to be doing over the next few years of my life or the time that's left me on this planet to uh, address this? What's my role in this? What, what can we do? Because clearly we failed. And yeah. because I have a child who's going to outlive me, God willing, uh, and for all the children out there. And it just, we, we have to get this right. And yeah. just for our listeners, we're recording this. This is, uh, there's a, across the country, there are protests about police brutality uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. So in some ways, we're just recording this right now in New York last night. There was a lot of protests, a lot of confrontations with police, yeah. just to give context for that. So this is 2020, and yeah. we're listening to another. Yeah, and it's so 25 years ago, Or 28 years ago, we went through this in Los Angeles and other cities, and here we are again, 
twenty. Yeah, and you were in LA for the Rodney King so aftermath. I, I was there when the verdict. Well, I actually was had, was on vacation and came back to a city in flames with a curfew with all the rest of it. So um, it's just the same film that we're <laughs> repeating over and over again. Although I would say in this instance, I see the the light of hope in it is that people of all colors are participating in these protests and the young people of every social strata and every color are saying enough. So, uh, and, and not just the young people, they're older people too, but I feel uh, there's a national outcry. It's not just yeah. one group of people or one neighborhood. So yeah. that's encouraging. Yeah, that is encouraging. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about how, in LA in 1992, as now you were writing for, and you're now the showrunner for uh, a television show that focuses quite explicitly on matters of race. To what extent um, do you feel like television can participate in this in a, in a constructive way? I know that for now, you're not sure what the future will be in the immediate term right. of the film of your new show, Twenties. but so the show is Twenties and it's about three young black women uh, who all are trying to make it in Hollywood uh, at a moment when Hollywood actually was beginning to open its doors more. Um, I'm proud to say that I received um, an email the other day from one of our former assistants who said that a friend of hers had texted her on Friday to say, that one of the episodes that we wrote of 20s gave her the courage to speak up for her rights and for the rights of people of color in her job. Right. And that to me was a reminder because there are moments when you write for television where you think, I am, I might as well have on clown shoes and a fright wig. You know, what am I doing with my life? I'm not in the thick <laughs> of fighting for the rights of others. But storytelling actually is a very powerful medium of uh, creating understanding, creating community encouraging people that certainly happened with different world which i was the showrunner of which sent a whole generation of kids to college frankly kids who were first generation uh college attendees uh and with this show i didn't know what impact it would have obviously representation is always good but to know that someone drew courage from one little half hour episode was very very helpful uh and encouraging and then We've, our writer's room closed just a few weeks ago before all of this erupted, all of these rebellions and riots and protests over the killing of uh, uh, George Floyd. And we don't reference the killing at all in any of our scripts. So it's going to be interesting to see if we do have a second season, what we rewrite and how we address it. Um, on a different world, we actually opened our sixth and final season with an episode on the riots. We mm. took two of our characters and had them get stuck in the LA riots. And I have to be honest and say, I think that's what got us canceled. <laughs> because NBC begged us not to do that. They said people are terrified by this. They don't want to see it. And we felt we had a strong responsibility because we were the show that addressed head on the issues affecting African Americans and people of color in general. Um, but I do think it cost us any future seasons. And I'm not sure it was our most successful work because it's it's such a huge, huge issue. You can't really do it justice um, in, you know, even a two-parter, so. I wonder whether allowing people to talk about it by putting it on TV is what you can hope for, that you don't provide the answer, but you start the conversation. That, that is the thing, is to provide exactly a starting point for people to wrap their minds around something, name it. So uh, it's, we'll see. Uh, but uh, I mean, honestly, objectively, artistically, I didn't think it was our best work. But yeah. we, I, do, I do feel we were right to at least try, even though it oh. got a hand. <laughs> There, that's the great thing about the Proust questionnaire. You can kind of be reflective and take the long view. In, exactly. Uh, no, I mean, and would it have been more powerful to be on the air for longer? Because uh, when we were going off the air, <clears throat> we got hundreds of letters from public school teachers mm. begging us not to go off the air because mm. 
they said we have classrooms full of kids who didn't even know college was a possibility for them until they saw your show. So you always have to weigh what am I giving up by making this one statement? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I apologize to our listeners for my dogs in the background. Uh, no, mine, so, is, mine is gnawing on his bone. I don't know if there's this annoying crunch in the background. <laughs> no, we can't hear it. But, but he was a dog and so it was <laughs> like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, for Susan's, I just want to say for the record, Susan's dog is being beautifully behaved and mine, as usual, are, are horrible. <laughs> um, what do you consider the most overrated virtue? Virginity. Oh, <laughs> men and women, or just in a just in I, I, nobody hails a male virgin. I mean, <laughs> you know, please. Uh, but everyone, everyone just enshrines this for women, and I'm I'm not a believer in promiscuity, namely because there are not that many people who'd be that interesting to sleep with. But <laughs> in my book. <laughs> But I do think this burden that we put on women to be virtuous. Yeah. Um, I, I would just have to say virginity and fidelity. I would put those two together, actually. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, I was just reading a piece on a very intellectual uh, site, the Daily Mail, UK. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Hallyday and C Catherine Deneuve. And apparently they carried on an affair for 50 years. What? Very quietly. And she was his Lucille, I guess he has a song about Lucille, the perfect woman. And they were lovers. And I think that Europeans are much more accepting of the fact that there are different kinds of love and that there isn't necessarily just one love in your life. Uh, and that a one love doesn't necessarily preclude another love. So uh, I, I would say virginity and fidelity. Mm -hmm. so those yeah. Two. The, the, and, phil the philosopher uh, Hannah Arendt, who had a lifelong affair with her teacher, Martin Heidegger, the philosopher, very complicated, mm -hmm. and was married after the war in America and wrote to her husband, if people knew what a marriage can really be, but they will not understand, so let's not share that. So she was married and then she had a lifelong affair and he knew this and she would write to him, I'm going to see Martin later today. And then she reported back and it is almost impossible to lose one's frame of reference and read these letters with a kind of open-mindedness and say, this is her life and she defines it in this way. And I'm keep on thinking, how can she do this? How can she do this? And she actually I said- was, Yeah, and her <laughs> husband was fine with it. I and mean, she, Amelia Earhart, when she married her husband, she wrote him a letter saying, I will not hold you to any medieval notions of fidelity and I expect you will do the same in my case. And right. so- just this sense of love is not possessiveness. And that yeah. I firmly believe. Um, so. so. On what occasion do you lie? Uh, um, I would say probably if I'm in a sticky situation and I need to obtain something for somebody else. Okay, but I like the specificity of that too. <laughs> the situation has to be sticky. You have to need something from someone and it has to be for somebody else. How often do you find those three conditions come together? Maybe more often than we would suspect? Well, happily, so far, I don't think I've had that many in my life, but it's, you know, it's those moments. I mean, I, actually, my husband has done this for me. So when my mother died, she died in her apartment and we didn't know we were supposed to call the police. We knew to call the doctor. And so they were literally loading the, the corpse into the hearse and a policewoman showed up and came into the apartment saying, I have to ascertain there's been no foul play and blah, blah. Anyway, so she could have sealed my mother's apartment because it didn't belong to me. Mm. And so she said, does your wife live here? And my husband sort of fibbed and said, well, she's been staying here, which absolutely was not true. But that is a perfect illustration of that is a necessary lie. <laughs> because <laughs> you're up against an unfair rule and you need, there's something that you need to obtain. So that was, that was my illustration. I can't think of an example for myself that's good, but. 
that to me illustrates what I'm talking about. Yeah. What do you most dislike about your appearance? What do I most dislike about my appearance? My nose. And especially in these Zoom days, <laughs> these I, look Zoom like, I, I look like a, a dog who's trying to be adopted. You know how they always put the dog nose first. <laughs> <laughs> All that's missing for me is the little bandana around my neck. <laughs> it should be, please adopt Sparky. <laughs> <laughs> an, an adoptable nose. Yeah, it's good. Which, which living person do you most despise? Well, <clears throat> I try not to despise because I believe with Nelson Mandela that resentment is like taking poison and expecting it to kill your enemy. However, mm. I would have to say <clears throat> the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in the year of our Lord 2020, uh, definitely I would rather say who, what person do I least respect in the world? It mm -hmm. would be he. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's an interesting rephrasing too, because I think some of our other interlocutors on this podcast have, have similarly, without mentioning the, the beautiful Nelson Mandela quote that, um, that you cited just now, uh, plenty of people have people in their lives who they don't respect, or, you know, in the, the current president of the United States has come up uh, several times in this questionnaire, uh, but to rephrase it as a, a lack of respect, it, it sort of preserves you from the poison in your veins while still enabling you to state an opinion that is not positive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it is, hate really is all consuming. So yeah. let us not become what we condemn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, I've seen that in a Pollyanna turn the other cheek and, I'm praying for him. I'm not praying for him. <laughs> I'm praying for him to be voted out. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, so, Uli and I often feel like we have to apologize in advance for these next two questions, and they reflect the the degree to which this is a 19th century questionnaire. Yes. Uh, so, the first of a pair of gendered questions now. What is the quality you most like in a man? And by the way, I don't have a problem with big definitions of gender because unlike quote unquote racial differences, I actually think some of them are genetically based and it's not mm -hmm. differences of quality, but I, I believe there are some innate differences. So someone can shoot me for that, but I actually believe it. Uh, in a man, I most admire compassion and vulnerability. Okay. Uh, what is the quality you most like in a woman? Uh, in a woman, I would have to say uh, self-assurance because mm -hmm. when you meet women who are unkind, they're generally at the bottom, extremely insecure. And so they make themselves feel better by insulting others. Um, I mean, we saw that a bit with Hillary Clinton, for example, the way people attacked her. I think for some people, yes, it was genuinely, they didn't like her politics, but for others, I think she was an irritating reminder of all that they had not achieved in their lives and therefore they had to tear her down. So uh, self-assurance, I think for women is the most important quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to say one of the things that um, struck me about you from the first time we met now, maybe 15 or so years ago, is that you are decidedly a woman who goes out of her way to be supportive of other women and to be kind to other women. And um, I think that that is very often a quality that's in short supply. I don't want to say specifically on the Upper East Side or specifically in New York City or specifically among alumni and alumni of Ivy League schools, whatever the, the demographic one might talk about, um, one of the things that I've always appreciated about you is that real conviction that it's important to be supportive of, of other women. And I think it comes through in your, in your novels. And I don't know, I mean, is that something also that, uh, that you feel like is an important part of your work as well as the way that you live? Uh, There's no question. I mean, I was fortunate enough to grow up around extraordinary women. My mother, Josephine Premise, and all of her friends who were these groundbreaking performers and actresses, Eartha Kitt, Diane Carroll, Lena Horne. And what I saw among them was my mother was so 
uh, confident of her own gifts. She didn't need to envy anybody else's because she felt there's only one me and that she very much instilled in me. And I saw what a web of support those women were for each other. Uh, and uh, what fun is it to be around women whom you can't learn anything from? <laughs> so, right. um, and she would always say to me, bitchiness is the last stretch for you, of unintelligent women. So mm-hmm. I, I do think it's very important as women to genuinely support each other, not pay lip service to it, not bash men and say, oh, if women ran the world, well, you know, maybe not because <laughs> we've both been stabbed in the back <laughs> and in the <laughs> by plenty of women. <laughs> so uh, it's just decency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which words or phrases do you most overuse? So my daughter pointed out the other day, um, sometimes I speak to her in, in Italian. And so my big verbal crutch in Italian is the word allora. And so <laughs> <laughs> she said, allora. the other day, you know, mommy, parfois, sometimes when you say allora, tu meubles ton silence, you're, you're furnishing your silence. It doesn't mean anything. You're just sort of, it's like a bridge to nowhere. <laughs> So, allora, it's like, and so, um, and especially in these COVID times when we don't know where we're going, we don't know what this, it's sort of this open question. So, uh, right now, it's a sign of directionlessness. Uh, in linguistics, I remember, Uli, I think you and I probably took one, this class together. I can't even remember which one it would have been, but Susan, Uli, and I went to college and grad school together and were in yeah. basically all the same classes. And in linguistics, they talk about several different functions for language. And one is called the phatic function, Mm P-H-A-T-I-C. And basically, words for furnishing silence. Yes. So, well, (laughs) yeah. uh, In all of those. Yeah. But so. It's like hamburger helper. It's verbal hamburger helper. It's just. (laughs) You're not saying anything. You're just. (laughs) <laughs> I have to say, Susan, okay, like, I want that verbal take. The way you say aloha, like, <laughs> something, I'm just going to take that up. It's like inshallah or something. Like, I said, it's not a bad verbal take, okay? You should just keep it. You should just absolutely keep it. I think it's totally the, it's the phatic function that you want to have as your hamburger helper for your daily discourse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, like everything about you, Susan, it's so much more elegant than its uh, counterparts in other people's lives. So yeah, my phatic function word is, or maybe, or um, yeah, do you, maybe. And I hear that even more on the podcast, which is horrifying, but uh, allora, yeah, Uli, if you and I could, could make a conscious effort to pick that up, I think our, our listeners would enjoy it. So Susan. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for, yeah, thank you for your service. When and where were you happiest? I struggle with this one because there are different moments of happiness throughout your life, hopefully. And I would have to say I've been lucky to be very happy through most of my life. So I I, I struggle to find the pinnacle moment. Um, I would say a moment of sheer bliss was three days after my daughter was born and I was sitting holding her and we were staying in a hotel because uh, our apartment was being (laughs) redone because she came a little early. And I just had this extraordinary feeling of peace and a sense that everything would be all right in my life uh, and that my life was truly complete. So if there, if I had to pick, if I were going to die tomorrow and I had to pick what's that pinnacle moment, I would, I would go to that one. But I, I qualify that by saying there's so much happiness and joy to be had in every single day. Uh, and in so many of the memories that I have that it's not, Oh, you know, my wedding day or, Oh, my 50th birthday, or it's, there's so many magnificent moments. It's by, by the way, speaking of post, and I use this line from, I think, La Prisonnière, when I was eulogizing my mother, he had a, the, one of the characters is talking about one of his lovers. And he said, in order to kill my memories of her, I would have to kill a thousand memories or 10,000 memories. It's just, there's so many. So for me, happiness is the same thing. I have 
millions of memories of happiness. And mm -hmm. I, I can't just pick one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which talent would you most like to have? I really wish I could sing. And uh, of course, I would love to be, you know, Audra McDonald or Andrea Bocelli. But I also, whenever I'm in a piano bar, I think I would have loved to have been the singer in a piano bar. Laura, just go. Laura! <laughs> <Nora. laughs> <laughs> at, at this moment, just go up to the piano, say, let me just... Slide over, take the mic. So after after the pandemic, you'll see me. Exactly. <laughs> and Bemelman's bar, just grabbing the microphone and saying, <laughs> New York, New York, New York. <laughs> We're ready for it. No one is going to take that mic away from you. I think that is the best idea. And I'm going to... Be at Bemelman's Bar for your first appearance. That's just that's the greatest idea. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Oh, if I could change one thing about myself, I would make myself more technologically savvy <laughs> and less allergic to technology. Uh, what do you consider your greatest achievement? My greatest achievement is. Uh, being there for the people I love. So I was very much there for my mother. She was uh, terminally ill for eight years and I was there for her every step of the way. Um, I've been there for my husband for 23 years. I'm there for my child. I'm there for my friends and just my steadfastness towards the people who have meant something to me or mean something to me my loyalty, um, and not cutting and running uh, in the moments when things get hard. Mm -hmm. That's my greatest achievement, I would say. Yep. That's Which, yeah, not necessarily a family trait. <laughs> so <laughs> we won't get into all the psychology of it, but <laughs> I'm kind of breaking with certain family traits. Uh, <laughs> which is a very hard thing to do because those instincts are within you when when they run deep, so and if uh, overcoming, yeah. overcoming yeah. the cutting and running trait, <laughs> <laughs> with, with which you've sadly become familiar. Yeah, but I, Susan, I, I really, I love that you you identify that as your greatest achievement because I think it is right to think of it as an achievement. It's it's a it's a choice and it's an active decision and it's a, you know a constant set of actions to be there for the people you love uh exactly. it is in your deeds and not just in your words and so yeah. uh the idea you know i think a lot of people like to think of themselves as loyal friends good friends but when you really think about the actions that you have taken to to underscore and to substantiate the idea of friendship or filial love or maternal love uh, it's it's really worth singling out as something one concretely and actively does. Well, so the Mormon self-help guru, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, <laughs> I don't know if oh. you remember that book, but the right. one great takeaway from it was he said, love is an act. And that to me is a very powerful thought because it's very easy to say, I love you or whatever, but it is, it's in the daily actions. And I remember once I had my daughter uh, and people would say, oh, you know, it's quality time. And I realized for me, that wasn't enough because it's time time. The, the relationship with a child and the relationship with a friend and the relationship with a spouse is not built in the grand moments. It is built in the daily tiny tasks that we do together. And in being there for the small moments, that's when people know they can rely on you in the big ones. Uh, and if you don't put in the time, you'll have nothing. So, if you were to die and come back as another person or a thing, who or what would that be? Okay, so I had uh, two thoughts. So, um, one, I would uh, come back as um, Andrea Bocelli, <laughs> or. Brava. <laughs> I would come back as Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis's opera glasses. 
because <laughs> think of the performances that woman must have seen in her life. <laughs> so I'd like to be Jackie O's opera glasses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great. Did have you when there was the big sale of her, the auction of her personal effects, were there any opera glasses in the auction? Do you remember? Did you see so there was that infamous measuring tape that I think went for fifty thousand dollars? <laughs> oh. Great investment. I don't know if there were opera glasses, but I'm just imagining she must have had some. Oh yeah. Where would you most like to live? I would most like to live on a rambling country estate in Devon, England. Okay, all right. Very that, Jane, Jane Eyre or something, yeah, it took his whole, my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, <laughs> the mad woman in your own attic. <laughs> exactly, exactly, no, I mean, I grew up on 19th century novels and my grandmother actually had a beautiful estate in uh, Gladstone, uh, New Jersey, and it was, my own little kingdom. So yes, I have, I have, I have fantasies of Downton Abbey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You would, you would uh, execute those incredibly well. I think <laughs> uh, was the, your grandmother's estate. Was that the place where uh, Jackie Kennedy went, tried to go shooting at one point? Uh, so joined the- she had bought a, a, a property in the area uh, mm-hmm. and she was going to join the hunt. And that's when my grandmother said, she'll ruin the hunt all those photographers. So it was very old fashioned place, <laughs> but I'm a big Jackie O fan. So, and she didn't ruin the hunt as it turns out. Uh, what is your most treasured possession? My most treasured possession is, are all my family photographs going back generations and including uh, my wonderful life with my husband and my child. So family photos all the way. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? So the lowest depth of misery uh, in his book, The Second Mountain, David Brooks cited a magnificent definition of obscenity. And he said, obscenity is covering up someone else's soul. And when you think about that, when you rape someone, you're covering up their soul. When you discriminate against someone, you're covering up their soul. When you reduce someone to badly paid labor, you're covering up their soul. So anything, any activity in which you are covering up someone else's soul or someone is covering your soul, um, basically disregarding the humanity of others. Um, that's the lowest depths of misery. I mean, that's, that's what the concentration camps were. The list goes on of all the human indignities or the moments where people are debased. It's the covering up of their souls. Yeah. What is your favorite occupation? My favorite occupation, I would have to say, is um, listening to a great book on Audible. Is there anyone, anything in particular during this lockdown you've just listened to? So I started with Eric Larson because I was anxious for keep calm and carry on inspiration. So I read The Splendid and the Vile, which is about Churchill and his family during the Blitz, which was great. Then I went to In the Garden of Beasts, and I listened to both of these on Audible. And it was well, with a roaring fire going. It was great. Um, in the Garden of Beasts, which is about the American ambassador Dodd to um, Germany when Hitler is first made, excuse me, chancellor in 1933. Uh, I and love. Yeah, it's a pretty remarkable and chilling book. And then I realized it was so terrifying because the parallels to what we're living here were so close that it began to really scare me. And I felt I, it's just too much to take on. So um, I'm now listening to Martin Chuzzlewit. <laughs> just completely relax. <laughs> oh, but that's great. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to hear a writer speak in praise of Audible. I was kind of late to that party, but like you, I'm I'm a complete believer now. For me, the condition is I have to be able to more or less enjoy the person's voice. Yes, and if, absolutely. You know, I've given up a few Audible books just because the voice was, irritate. was, was irritating or driving me crazy. But I think there is 
among some writers and readers, there's a sort of a persisting snobbery that if you're listening to it, somehow that's not reading it. But of course, that's not true. It's just reading it in a different way. Exactly. Exactly. And you are immersing yourself in it almost more because you're just, it's a fully sensory experience. I, I, Audible has really um, made it into an art form to cast uh, real actors. So actually there's uh, the Don Katz, the founder of Audible is actually an NYU grad and he founded it because he studied with Ralph Ellison at NYU and Ellison said that this kind of America and its vernacular is the source of American great literature. So Ellison thought listening to people speaking is the source of writing. So Don Katz actually invented Audible, which is now sold to Amazon because he studied with Ellison. That's and, fascinating. And Joe Morton, who read Invisible Man, it's like he's acting out the entire novel in front of exactly. him. Exactly, exactly. You're seeing a voice give life to writing, which, and I like always that it was connected to Ellison who said, writing is actually listening very carefully to how people speak and make sense of their worlds. I completely agree with that. And just as that's why in the Proust questionnaire it is, what is your most overused phrase? It says something about you. And as someone who has to write a lot of dialogue, I am listening for the cadences, for the voices, for the verbal tics, for the... Yeah, and, and, the, and the great richness of actually really listening and not thinking someone said this, but actually saying this is how they said it. Exactly, because the words that they picked were specific and say something about them. Right. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But that's, of course, why that question about overused phrases is on the questionnaire, but you're exactly right. And Proust, of all people, believed that. One of the things he was masterful at was catching the little idiosyncrasies and often kind of pretentious ticks of, of people's speech and odd mistakes. And, and it's such a delight to read him. I've not yet listened to him on, on uh, Audible, but I know people really like the experience of, of reading Proust on Audible too. And I think it must be because again, of that richness and the capacity he had to listen and reproduce. But for you as a, as a writer of dialogue now, primarily in your, in your work for television, I would imagine. Does that help? Like, do audible books give you ideas for how you want to write certain bits of dialogue for the show? Or is it? Well, it really depends. Because since I'm so mired in the 19th century, <laughs> in the literary space, that's not very helpful. So <laughs> I have to rely on the much younger people I work with to sort of drag me kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Um, but I will say the methods of, I mean, Dickens listened to the voices around him and everyone speaks very specifically. And so I'm yeah. going to listen to the voices of younger people. You and I had a whole discussion about low key, this new expression. I love low key. Low key. Low key. Low key. Low key. <laughs> I'm trying to be inspired by Dickens, but <laughs> high key, I better be listening to other voices. High <laughs> key. Is up to you to introduce. Yeah, shortly after you taught me low key and the idea that it's actually an adverb. So it's not like, oh, the party was low key, which you no. and I might have said. No. <laughs> our generation. <laughs> but uh, one low key of, ignored me. <laughs> or one of our, the one of the wonderful uh, young people who walk our dogs when we're in New York City uh, called Adrian once said to me, yeah, you know, I'm low key starting, starting to like chihuahuas. <laughs> <laughs> and the usage was so great, but it was, I wouldn't have, I think even seized upon that little, uh, sort of, to me, oddity of speech. If you and I hadn't, no, just it was very odd to me when I first heard it and I was trying to figure out the, it's appropriate usage. <laughs> We're low key making lasagna. Come on over. Exactly. What, <laughs> <laughs> what is your most marked characteristic, the trait that others notice in you first, you think? I think people notice that I'm very outspoken. Um, <laughs> not a quiet person. So I think that's probably my most marked characteristic. If you want somebody who's going to shut up, I'm just the wrong person. As my husband pointed out to me once, I would never make it as a political wife. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> just standing quiet, it's keeping it's your head no. down. They'd have that to is not me. me. <laughs> yeah, it well, would, would be the attic. <laughs> And yeah, you would be the mad woman of the attic and you would never have a shot at Bemelman's bar then no, either. No, or, no, or, which, you know, that's my plan. <laughs> Self-appointed cabaret performer. Um, what do you most value in your friends? What I most value in my friends is their brutal honesty. Mm-hmm. I love it when my friends will point out to me what I have done that falls short of the mark of kindness or intelligence or uh, my best friend actually pointed out to me at one point that I was basically going to follow in the footsteps uh, of someone in my family and marry a cat. (laughs) And she said, I'll support you if you do that. But what was that life so great that you want to replicate that? And it was what Oprah would call an aha moment. So uh, when your friends love you enough to be brutally frank and honest with you and let you know mm-hmm. when they think you're in trouble or uh, when you have not acted appropriately, they're doing you a big favor. Mm-hmm. And my friends have all made me be- a better person. Uh, so. Susan, who, who are your favorite writers? So my favorite writers, George Eliot, mm-hmm. Balzac, Mm-hmm. Um, Flaubert for speaking of beautiful musical sentences. I mean, the man would spend hours every single day on them. <laughs> yeah. he, he would shout them aloud to make exactly. sure they didn't sound exactly. Yeah. Um, Henry James, because I thought, I think he had such extraordinary insights on women and strong women. And because mm-hmm. Uh, I very much relate to the world that he depicts. My father's family is very much of that world of sort of the Boston Brahmins. Um, and uh, my father reminded me a lot of Dr. Sloper. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Washington Square only didn't think that was ugly. So, <laughs> or dumb. Um, oh but uh, his, his depictions of women are just shattering. Um, As an essayist, I'd have to say James Baldwin. Uh, As a poet, I'd have to say Emily Dickinson. Um, And then uh, there's one book by Alexandre Dumas that's very, very not well known at all. Um, It's very obscure, I should say. It's called Georges. And it's the only book in which he really dealt with race. And it's a depiction of, it's really his um, his own father's life. Uh, it's about the mulatto son of uh, Planter and uh, about that whole sort of subset of of mulatto aristocracy in a racist system. And it's pretty shattering. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I just would have to say, back to Martin Chuzzlewit, for me, the sine qua non is Charles Dickens. Uh, for me, and, and back to what we're talking about with language, how musical it is, uh, yeah, he's also painterly in his language. It's so full yeah. of extraordinary images. I mean, there's a a line in um, David Copperfield where a woman's uh, incessant verbiage is described as this waterfall that they're all tumbling in because she just won't stop talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> In our mutual friend, there's a character who's uh, referred to as the table leaf because whenever people are giving a dinner party and they need an extra person, wow. this person is brought in. I mean, just the the, the <laughs> image of the case. Um, but also thematically, he everything he wrote about is what we're still living. Um, and one of the projects I, I worked on a few years ago that I still hope one day we'll see the light of day, it was an updating of A Tale of Two Cities to today. When you read A Tale of Two Cities, which he actually wrote in the, I think, 1850s, mm-hmm. in response to the rise of income inequality uh, and, and looking back and reflecting on the revolution and, and its discontents, uh, A Tale of Two Cities is New York and every other American city today. Yeah. So uh, his profound humanity uh, and his profound love and concern for children and and all of the marginalized in society 
uh, just really, to me, resonates to this day. And then just the, the language is so exquisite and beautiful and, and what that meant, how he used adverbs and adjectives and to, I, I mean, there's that incredible opening of Bleak House that portrays the stagnation of the courts by having endless sentences with no verbs in them. It, it is just genius. <laughs> yeah, no, he is. Sorry, let me go. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, I I just re I just taught a tale of two cities for the first time in a long time recently, mm-hmm. and that was I think one of the things that the graduate students in the beginning, I think, were kind of concerned that I was teaching such a known to their to them pedestrian Pedestrian. book you know it's not some obscure scholarly difficult thing you know everyone has you know most people who wind up in grad school for for literary studies have read it at some point when they're young or they saw the bbc television show and the writing as you say is just staggering there's a description of a of a country chateau that gets burned at one point during the revolution yeah. And where Dickens imagines that you see the stone faces on the gargoyles on the castle actually yeah. change as the as the castle is going up in flames. It's just unbelievable. And it was really fun to see these graduate students, very gifted, obviously, um, you know, kind of burgeoning critics of, of literature. Most of them chose to write their final papers about that book. And in the beginning of the course, I think very few people were prepared to be as impressed and dazzled by it as they were. It's just unbelievable. And he's um, often dismissed as sentimental, but there's always, yeah. such a, if you look, there's such a dark underpinning. And he deals a lot with prostitution in different forms, whether through marriage or actual prostitution. And, and Madame Lafarge, I mean, one of the reasons she hates the Evremonts is that they raped her sister. So right. <laughs> it's yeah. he is not afraid to deal with the heart of darkness, but he put it in this sort of coding that a Victorian audience could accept. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty shattering writing. Of any of these fictional universes, who is your hero of fiction? I would have to say Georges from this um, this uh, Alexandre Dumas book because he's this very noble character. Uh, He's fearless. He's standing up for his rights and the rights of others. He adores his father. Um, And he's this man sort of caught between worlds uh, and trying to forge a space for himself in a world that wants to oppress him. So I've I've never even heard of this novel. Well, well, see, I mean, it's one of those... (laughs) It's great. No, I'm so happy. This is why it's so wonderful to talk to you. I'm going to look it up. It's, it's like you, we know the Black Count and we know who... Yes, exactly. Exactly. I don't know this novel. So well, and it co- covers some of the same territory as the Black Count because yeah. it's clearly his sort of meta novel about his father, but it's also about himself. Um, great. Look it up. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And there, it is, it's also in translation. Yeah. 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 Oh, that, that, yeah, that's good to know, because I feel like Dumas, he, it seems like he wrote hundreds of novels, and I, a lot of them probably rightly, you know, have been forgotten or, you know, haven't, yeah. haven't come in English, but I'm glad that our listeners can find that one. Uh, that's, yeah. that's fascinating. Who are your heroes in real life? Uh, my heroes in real life, I would have to say, are all the women I grew up around. So starting with my mother, who I mentioned, Josephine Premise, and her best friend, Diane Carroll, who just left us uh, in October, um, and Lena Horne and Eartha Kitt and um, Carmen de Lavala, the extraordinary actress and dancer, mm-hmm. because they really made a way out of no way, as the expression goes. Uh, they were coming up at a time when there was no space for them um, on stages and in Hollywood. And they never, never, never turn to bitterness. Um, there's a wonderful quotation from Camilla Williams, who was actually the first Black woman to sing uh, in a major company on a New York stage. She did Cho Cho San in 1944 uh, for wow. the opera. And it was before Marian Anderson had her debut at the Met in 19, whatever, 56. And they were actually friends. And people asked her, aren't you bitter that you never got to sing on the Met stage and your friend did? And she said, I don't believe in bitterness. Bitterness poisons your song. 
And I would say that that's really would be the motto of the women I grew up around. They would get together, talk about what they'd been through, drink champagne, <laughs> lick their wounds, and get back out there being creative and being beautiful. Um, and and then I would also add to those to that list of heroines, my my white grandmother, my father's mother. Uh, she was born in 1894, and uh, she was, her father was an arch, um, really white supremacist. He wrote white supremacist pamphlets. Um, he was terrified of miscegenation. Uh, she, they didn't even have any black help. And when my parents got married, she immediately met my mother and liked her and just said, okay, this is, <laughs> this is who my son has chosen. And the newspapers were calling her and saying, aren't you worried? And she said, I've never worried about anything in my life. I'm not going to start now. Um, and when we, my parents went to Italy to get away from sort of all the, the notoriety around their marriage here. And when we came back to the States, the first thing my grandmother did was to bring us to her church and march us down the central nave. And in Boston, and this was actually in Gladstone, New Jersey, St. Louis okay. Episcopal Church. Now, again, this is an area where there wasn't even black help. There were literally no black people in this area. And um, I realize now why she did that and why my mother told me the story. She was letting her community know, mm -hmm. these are my grandchildren. I am not ashamed. I'm not hiding them. Does anyone have an objection? I didn't think so. Let's move on. <laughs> So um, she also kept all the hate mail that she received when my parents got married, um, some of which included, you know, notes of condolence from friends of hers on their engraved stationery. And I think that's such a powerful thing because it is a now a historic mirror. We have it in the family archive of what they went through and how people reacted. And this is a sort of thing that would be forgotten if we didn't have these, these horrible missives. Uh, so I, I love the fact that she understood the historicity of the moment uh, mm -hmm. and that she preserved that. So we would understand what that history had been. Wow. As opposed to burying it, which is why we're having so many problems in this country now, because everything's been buried as opposed to let's keep it and then let's examine it. So you have yeah. a record of all your grandmother's uh, family's friends who took a position in public, but who otherwise those positions would be not talked about. Exactly. Exactly. Amazing. Amazing. There was one question, I think, Carrie, we didn't get to it. Which historical figure do you most identify with from the past? Oh, okay. So <laughs> this has evolved over time. <laughs> And this will make people put together a GoFundMe, let's send her to a psychiatrist as soon as possible. <laughs> so uh, when I was young, it was Napoleon and Queen Victoria. I mean, <laughs> Both. Just so insane. Um, <laughs> Napoleon, because he was an outsider, mm. uh, and although I, I really wasn't, and I liked the Napoleonic furniture, but I really wasn't looking very closely. <laughs> 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 Cutting a swath of destruction through Europe. So we'll, we'll, we'll chalk that one up to youthful folly. Queen Victoria, I, again, I love the 19th century. I loved Victorian furniture. I love the whole aesthetic, but I also felt a huge responsibility to, conduct myself a certain way and and represent as the young people say and so I identified with this sort of this dignity and reserve and mask of command if you will so uh now as a grown woman I would have to say I still go back to uh now to the 18th century um and the very early 19th I would have to say the Chevalier de Saint-Georges who they called the Black Mozart <laughs> Um, and Alexandre Dumas' father. Now, obviously, I've not accomplished anything remotely approaching what either of those gentlemen did, but uh. um, I do identify, A, with their, uh, their clash combination of cultures. They were both uh, the children of Black women uh, from Haiti, what is now Haiti, uh, and um, French um, aristocrats. My father wasn't French, but he was... Um, 
uh, of English descent, American, um, and they were outsiders and they were, uh, again, forging a spot for themselves in a world that didn't really have a place for them. Uh, and I think also as people who are descended of, um, in their case, slaveholders, <laughs> and then in their cases, the mothers who actually were slaves, there's a duality and there's a, you're on the one hand, the beneficiary of a certain kind of privilege. And at the same time, you're also among the oppressed. And so you're in this a little equivocal situation. Um, and a discovery that I made uh, three years ago now is that my father's family were actually New England slave traders. Uh, and that's how they started to build their little fortune. Um, and so for me, it's very resonant, this notion of part of you is actually the exploiter <laughs> and part of you is the exploited. Yeah. Uh, and you represent Caribbean culture and you represent European culture and you're forging a something, something new. Um, so as crazy as that may sound, I, I'm <laughs> neither a general in an army <laughs> nor a master swordsman and <laughs> musician, but uh, just that sense of duality um, and uh, embracing your outlier status and forging away. I, that's what I identify with. Susan, um, for our listeners, I mean, we could, I would love to hear even much more about this. The Chevalier de Saint-Simon, is there a record? Is there something people could learn? So the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, if you Google, there are, so apparently Mozart actually heard a lot of his compositions as a child and was inspired by them. So if you Google him, there are a few books about him. None of them are really riveting, but they're, at least you get a sense of who he was. Uh, and he had this remarkable life. Um, and then there are a few documentaries about him and you, there are orchestras that actually play his pieces. Um, so there's a good, there's a good project for a young, uh, screenwriter or filmmaker. So. Well, so that, and I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because I first heard about him. I'd known, I'd grown up knowing about Alexandre Dumas' father because my father talked about him all the time, but, uh, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, um, there's an actor that I worked with who was obsessed with the story and wanted it made into a movie. And this is the kind of thing that I still feel Hollywood is hesitant about. Are those outlier figures uh, when it comes mm. to people of color? Um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the slaves who stayed on the plantation, but uh, we don't see yeah. the people who, represented something completely different. Um, and there was the beautiful British movie, Belle, I don't know if you saw that, by the director, mm -hmm. Amma Sante, uh, who dealt with a figure, um, Dido Bell uh, Lindsay. But um, it, it's not something that, and Hollywood doesn't know how to do period with black people and then you know add to that the whole element of, um, it's the 18th century and they're French. I mean, forget it. <laughs> yeah. It's too much. We had Ama Asante come to NYU and talk about Belle, and she was inspired by a painting, I think. Yes, it's, it's, it will, because if you go to, um, it's a, uh, it's a grand home in Hampstead. Yes. And the painting is, the real, the original, I think, is back in Scobie Castle in Scotland, but Pop they have a copy at the place, the house where she lived. Um, so. But I think Ama Asante went to Scotland. I think she was actually maybe trained to be a doctor. It was so this picture of a black girl and a white girl and a, that she yeah, said. Yeah, it is. Well, it. so because it's a it's a po portrait by Zoffany. Yeah. And actually, a lot of people, when the movie came out, they misinterpreted because uh, they she had a turban and, and a big plume. And they said, mm -hmm. well, you know, she was obviously a servant. This is what critics were writing because, and it's sort of, you don't understand. That was the style, this Orientalist. I mean, it goes back to the yeah. 17th century in Italy. You can find Renaissance paintings of these women in these Orientalist turbans. It was the height of fashion. And so often he was obviously much more taken with her than with her white cousin. Uh, and she is absolutely depicted as a lady. Um, and she was also, we don't know everything about her, but we know she was the assistant to her uncle, who was basically the head of the high court. 
Uh, and for a woman to have been the amanuensis of a learned man, I mean, clearly she was intelligent and clearly she was respected. So it was interesting to see the American reaction and the American misreading. I mean, they saw the turban and immediately thought Mammy. And it was sort of, that turban has nothing to do with Mammy. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. an Orientalist fashion statement that was what the most elegant women did in the 18th century. So, Yeah, no, and you and I talk a lot about this, Susan, and, and the sort of, the very limited perspective that Americans can have about about race, about gender, about privilege. And so, uh, you know, you're, to me, you're bringing up as an historical figure that you identify with someone like the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who, again, can't be reduced to the figure of, for whatever difficulties and challenges he faced, and however unfair it is that he's been written out of musical history, probably in some profound way, that's not tantamount to... Um, Casting him as, as yet another slave, as yet another. You no, know, he was the, the, the glory of the court of Louis yeah. XVI. And, you know, uh, he was a, a very acclaimed figure in his day. He was the greatest swordsman in Europe um, and the greatest <laughs> orchestra leader at the time. So yeah. it's much more, and that, that's why I love that film because it captured the subtleties uh, that yes, right. there was racism, but at the same time, there was an embracing. Um, and it's yeah. interesting, uh, uh, Annette Gordon-Reed, who's written so eloquently about the, the Hemings uh, and sure. Fellow and, and Jefferson, I had an opportunity once to ask her um, why it was that in America, the mulatto children of slaveholders were never acknowledged. They would maybe be made house servants, but there was this sort of code of silence around the fact that they were related Whereas in Europe, like, they were embraced as the heirs. They were given their titles. Uh, there's a whole PhD thesis I found about mulatto heiresses who were sent to England in the 18th and early 19th century to find husbands. Mm -hmm. And um, she said she attributed it to the French, to the European sense of family. In Europe, blood trumps everything. So if you're related to somebody, that's it. And it doesn't matter. Uh, all the rest of it gets cast aside. Whereas here, we have a different approach. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> different, uh, to put it kindly. What are your favorite names? Aaron, Bristol, and Neno. Neno is my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and Aaron and Bristol, your husband and your daughter. Yes. Can yes. you add, is, would, you, would you maybe... Just uh, to gratify my crazy dog lady, would you tell us a little bit about your, your dog and your dog's name? Because that to me is a great name and a great dog. <laughs> so uh, Prince is a rescue. He's a mutt. And uh, we found him at an adoption fair or, or oh. my husband says he found us and he walked towards my husband and, and daughter and I was on my way to meet them at this fair in Union Square and on a Sunday, and they said, we found him, and I arrived, and it was all over. Um, but he came with this name, Prince, and as it turns out, my husband, when he was a child, had a dog named Prince, who tragically was killed by a car. So it felt like kismet that this dog was named Prince. Prince, the singer, had just died the year that we adopted him, so everyone thinks right. named him after <laughs> the singer, but we didn't name him. He came with his name. He's very regal. So. I think it works. <laughs> He's a noble beast with a noble nose. And I'm just sorry that he hasn't nosed his way into Zoom at all today. But yeah. yeah. Yes. What is it that you most dislike? What is it that I most dislike? I most dislike um, anything that's just not at all aesthetically pleasing and that's tacky. <laughs> So <laughs> whether that's just a really bad outfit or a strip mall or anything that just, there's been no attempt to create beauty um, that I, I can't stand. I need beauty. What is your greatest regret? My greatest regret is not taking an economics class in college. <laughs> <laughs> and 
uh, and in general, uh, not taking more advantage of my time in college. I, I was in the dining hall quite a bit chatting away. <laughs> I could have spent a bit more time in the books. And so, yeah, the, the, I would say those two things. And and you and I have discussed this. You know, I'm a I'm a frustrated academic. So there's part of me that wishes that I'd gone for my my PhD in history. But there's still time. There is still time, and you you would do honor to our ranks. Uh, <laughs> I've tried to point out to you that it's not all the glamour that you see in me and Uli today at home <laughs> on Zoom. Uh, but yeah, you're right. There is still time. So. I'm 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 pushing for that. If if you can find the time, that look would, out for me. I'm coming to a a, a, a professorial <laughs> lounge somewhere near you. <laughs> me and my self authorized self. <laughs> Your self authorized self ascertaining whether you'd like to be in a story. Um, how would you like to die? Oh, how would I like to die? The way my grandmother did peacefully in my own bed after a lovely day, just going to bed and wow. that's it, not waking up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be pretty good. Yeah. What is your motto? My motto is be an optimist. By the time life proves you wrong, you'll already be dead. <laughs> so <laughs> I really, I really believe in hoping against hope to the last minute. And I very much learned that from my mother. You know, a woman who a day before dying, when my husband had come to pay his last respects, said to him, I am so lucky. And there she was on what they now call a ventilator, you know, reduced to whatever, skin and bones, uh, to be able to say, you're so lucky and to still believe in the goodness of mankind. Mm -hmm. So um, I never give up. It's just keep be, be an optimist. Not blind to all the ills of the world, but to believe that we can do better and that we will do better. It's, it's yeah. Susan, we add one question to this questionnaire, which is who would you like to hear answer the questions on the Pus questionnaire? Okay, I would really like because what I didn't include in my list of favorite authors are some of my favorite historians. Oh. Um, among them, Eric Foner. Mm -hmm. and oh, yeah. Gordon Reed. Um, so I would love to hear either of them. I would love to hear Julian Fellows, his, Oh yeah. He'd be For the Downton Abbey aspect of things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, those would be great. And, uh, yeah, Eric Foner is in me, is a colleague of mine and is, uh, I, I've been at exactly one dinner seated next to him and is a wonderful man. Uh, his wife is a fascinating dance historian. Willie and I have been toying with the idea maybe of trying to do this, interview as a couple's interview sometime and, and talk to two people at That's once. So, powerful. Although that could uh, lead to some divorces. Who's the greatest love well, of your life? <laughs> that's, that's the, that's the thing. We're not sure. And is it incredibly sort of flat footed and, um, <laughs> and potentially, you know, unethical of us to threaten the foundations of people's relationships by suggesting that we talk to them together about the greatest love of their life when they were happiest. But, um, but uh, yeah, but Eric Foner would be a, would be really fun. And Annette Gordon Reed obviously would be amazing to talk to. I think. Yeah. They're, I think they'd both be pretty and, phenomenal. And for our listeners, Eric Foner is a great historian of the civil war and basically race in the 19th century. And Annette Gordon Reed is the person who wrote about Sally Hemings and Jefferson's, mistress and the, the, the mother of his children. And she is the one who wrote this book long before there was a DNA test that proved, exactly. that proved the truth of her book that she said, I did not need this DNA test because the archives held this story for 200 years. And people had written countless biographies of Jefferson and deliberately not acknowledged it. So she said it wasn't science that proved it, but it was people distorting the archives. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. true. So they would be great candidates. And who is the third one? The fellows? And so I don't know this. The um... fellows is he created Downton Abbey. Okay. Uh, and he has a new series on called Belgravia. And he's just this wonderful. And he won an Oscar for um, uh, uh, Gosford Park. Okay. Uh, he's just a wonderful raconteur. He's very, very amusing. He's very well read. 
Um, he's clearly steeped in 19th century literature and, and inspired by it. And, and he speaks in epigrams, so he, he would be great. Um, and also John Meacham, another favorite. Oh, yeah. He's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, he'd be wonderful. And he's he'd very be wonderful. Very, yeah. very, very funny. Um, well, well, Susan, we have to say, especially in this time when our country is going through these convulsions of trying to do a proper accounting of its own history. It was, you're so funny. And at the same time, like every single reference, I'm taking notes. I think I have to read this book. I have to look up this person. I have to reread this one. So it's a great combination, actually, and very unusual, I think. Susan, I knew that you would be uh, just the best person for us to talk to. So much fun. So brilliant. Thank you. So thank, you thank you. This is so uplifting in the midst of all this mishigas. It's like, I'm, okay. Absolutely. And thank you. Same here. You are the best. Bye. The best, the best. Bye. Bye, love.